Um, hello, I'm Alejandra Tascon. I'm a criminal barrister at Palm Court Chambers, and today we will be doing a webinar on remote hearings and witness credibility. The other two speakers are Ezra, who's a civil practitioner specialising in employment, commercial and property, and you will also hear from Paul Mertens, who is a family and civil specialist. So I will be addressing you from a criminal perspective. Now there are various issues in, with remote hearings that affect witness credibility in the criminal courts. Firstly, one of the bars to remote hearings is the inability to have conferences with your client when issues arise in the trial process. And the second issue is the assessment of demeanour by the tribunal of fact, and that's what I will be focusing on. So what do I mean by demeanour? Well, demeanour excludes the context of the evidence, but it includes everything that's visible, um, visible and uh, in audio by form of self-expression, which is manifested by a witness, uh, whether it be fixed or variable, voluntary or involuntary. So for example, the way in which the witness reacts to questions, the way in which that they give their evidence, and these are subject to many variables that will affect that demeanour. For example, nerves, confidence and unfamiliarity with their surroundings. Now these variables can often cause misjudgment and lead the tribunal of fact to draw conclusions without fully understanding the reasons behind those reactions. And this is where I will narrow it down to the criminal approach in particular. Now, the criminal approach is very helpful to set out in the Crown Court Compendium. Uh, I was discussing the Crown Court Compendium that very helpfully sets out guidance for judges when juries are being sworn in and empanelled. Once the juries are sworn in and empanelled, juries are given various directions. And one of the directions that the judges are encouraged to give is to tell members of the jury to listen and to watch the evidence and to try not to take notes. The reason for that is because of demeanour, because it's important that jurors and tribunals of fact are able to assess the demeanour of the witness. Demeanour is also something that comes into play when hearsay evidence is given. So, for example, when hearsay evidence is admitted, the judge will warn jurors or the tribunal of fact that they haven't been able to assess the demeanour of the maker of the statement and therefore they should approach it with caution. So as we can see throughout the trial process, demeanour plays a, a huge factor in, the, in assessing credibility. But demeanour comes with dangers. And it's in my view um, that we must be careful when we're assessing demeanour because a forgetful witness does not necessarily mean that they are a liar. Equally, a crying witness does not necessarily mean that they are a victim. And nor does an agitated witness necessarily mean that they are aggressive and therefore the aggressor. So we must be careful when looking at the demeanour of the witnesses or the accused. Neither jurors nor lawyers are trained behavioural psychiatrists and that's another thing that we must be careful of when we are looking and approaching demeanour as the gateway to credibility. And there has been much debate in the scientific community about this, but unfortunately we don't have enough time in the seminar to discuss this. But there is a common view in the scientific community um, when assessing demeanour for credibility. And it's mainly that we must be careful not to confuse various types of emotions when considering the person that's given evidence. Because the person that's given evidence may be in fear of being disbelieved, but they may also be in fear of being apprehended. And that's a distinction that we need to be able to draw when we're assessing credibility. There's also the variable factor of, of personalities. Some people may be very good at telling lies and other people may have raised emotions. And that's a distinction that we need to be able to draw when we are considering demeanor. But in any event, emotions and lying, emotions around lying and untruthfulness can often be really difficult to tell apart. And there is research that shows 
that as an individual, we are often only 50% accurate when we are assessing whether or not a person is lying. So why is demeanor so important in the criminal courts? Well, when we're dealing with criminal offences, we're dealing with offences that carry a human element, a mental human element that is often achieved through uh, intentional pre-planning or reckless thought process. And it's because of this emotional human element that demeanour becomes an important factor to take into account. But when we're considering this, we must always be aware of unconscious bias and first impressions based on social appearances, education levels, because this varies across the board. And it doesn't necessarily mean that a person is telling the truth or that they are lying, uh, varying depending on their appearance. Now, there is an important case that was dealt with um, not too long ago, and you will get a copy of this after this seminar, but it's the case of the Crown and D, where His Honour Judge Murphy was dealing with a, a lady that was due to give her evidence wearing a hijab. Now, the judge went on to say that it would be unfair to expect a juror to try and evaluate the evidence given by a person who she cannot see because that deprives them of the essential tool for doing so, namely being able to see the demeanor of the witness, her reaction to being questioned, and her reaction to other evidence as it's given. This case, in my view, clearly sets out why demeanor is so important in criminal cases, because we are dealing with the human element of offenses, and therefore we must be able to assess the human reactions to questions and to the evidence that's being given to courts. And it's ultimately why, in my view, remote trials simply would not work and would not give the defendant a fair trial. While the research around using demeanor as a tool to assess credibility suggests that it might not always be accurate, it continues to play a vital part in the criminal justice system. And it plays a vital part because of the human and mental element that it carries. And these are elements that vary as society changes. And that's why having a tribunal of fact from members of the community provides the correct and adequate checks and balances to ensuring that assessing that human element of demeanor is done safely within the criminal courts. It's important that when leaving demeanor to a jury or the tribunal of facts that we have a cross section of society with varying life experiences that are able to either, that are able to connect and to distinguish their experiences from the person given evidence. And that's why in my view, demeanor is incredibly important in, in the criminal justice system. However, it's not something that can be adequately done through remote hearings. And um, thank you. I will now pass you on to Ezra MacDonald. Thanks. Um, it may not surprise you to learn that I, I disagree slightly with Annie's view on this. Um, when I started thinking about this, what I was interested in was, should we be proceeding with remote hearings? If so, when? And um, clearly one important factor is demeanour, because it's much more difficult to assess demeanour in a remote hearing. I think absolute, Ali is absolutely right about that. Um, but the question is, should we really care about witness demeanour? And I started digging around in the scientific research and somewhat to my surprise, the scientific evidence suggests that what we all think about the assessment of witness demeanour in terms of credibility is largely wrong. So I'm going to put out a few bullet points, some small factoids that you might like. Uh, the first point is this, when it comes to... When it comes to watching uh, witness testimony, people have got an only 50% chance of accurately detecting whether a witness is lying or not. So that's about as good as coin toss, give or take. They are less accurate when they're assessing testimony over videotape than they are when they're looking at a transcript or dealing with audio recordings. And that's precisely the opposite of the conclusion that you'd expect if demeanor is important in assessing credibility. Uh, it gets worse because the more that an individual relies on intuition, the more they rely on that sort of gut feeling that they're looking at someone shifty, the less likely they are to be right in assessing whether or not that individual is telling the truth. 
and it gets worse. It turns out that the more experience you've got in detecting lies, so if you're a, a judge or a police officer, um, you don't actually get better at detecting the lies. What you do get is much more confident in your own assessment of the witness's credibility. So that should cause us some concern if even experienced judges are not more reliable than the man on the street. And it gets even worse than that, because the older you get, the worse you are at detecting lies. And um, with, with all respect to the judiciary, uh, quite a few of the more senior judiciary are, um, well, and they're fairly senior. My second bullet point is that things which are commonly thought to indicate that someone is lying. So I'm thinking about things like um, not making eye contact, fidgeting, touching your hair, shifting around in your seat, none of those things reliably indicate dishonesty. Things that are supposed to indicate dishonesty by judges, so for instance, going back over a story and revising it, turn out to be indicators of truthfulness. And that's because when someone tries to remember what happened, their memory is fallible. So they go back over the recollection of events, and they try and fill in details, they try and uh, fill in the blanks. But that's a, a perfectly normal process, and it's in fact what genuine, honest witnesses do. There's only one good demeanour indicator of lying, and that is lack of body movement. And that's slightly counterintuitive, um, so it deserves an explanation. And the explanation is this. It's actually quite difficult to tell lies. It requires quite a lot of concentration. So when a witness is trying to tell a fib, that means they focus on the fib that they're telling and they stop doing things which involve extraneous body movement. Um, similarly, lack of hand gestures, the less hand gestures someone uses on average, the more likely they are to be fibbing. But again, it's, it's just not a reliable indicator. Now this isn't to say that cross-examination doesn't work, um, I hope. Cross-examination works surprisingly well. Uh, it works well for two reasons. One is we've got evidence to put to the witness so we can prove that they've been caught out in a lie. Secondly, practice in cross-examination makes individuals actually pretty good at getting liars to tell inconsistent stories. The reason for all of this is that it's difficult to tell lies effectively. So when people do tell lies, they tell lies which are less logical, less consistent, and contrary to popular opinion, less detailed than people who are giving genuine accounts. But none of this has got anything at all to do with witness demeanor. Now, this is a point that's been noticed by the civil courts. So I'm going to cite a case. Um, uh, this is a case I think everybody ought to know about. It's the case of uh, the Crown on the application of SS and the Secretary of State for the Home Department, uh, neutral citation 2018 EWCA Civ 1931. And I'm going to quote the judgment of Lord Justice Leggett from that case. He said, to attach any significant weight to such impressions, that's demeanor, in assessing credibility, risks making judgments which at best have no rational basis and at worst reflect conscious or unconscious biases and prejudices. In the same judgment he goes on to say, rather than attempting to assess whether testimony is truthful from the manner in which it's given, the only objective and reliable approach is to focus on the content of the testimony and to consider whether it's consistent with other evidence, including evidence of what the witness has said on other occasions and with known or probable facts. Now that's all, for those of you who know the case of Guestman, that's all very consistent with what's said in Guestman, but that's a, um, a, a case for another webinar, I suspect. Um, the point is this, we shouldn't pay attention no. to witness demeanor. Um, there are uh, other cases which made much the same point. Some of the case law seeks to dilute it slightly, but the, the message stands. 
and it's Court of Appeal authority, so it's pretty compelling. It's also consistent with what the research says. So um, I, I think that certainly in civil cases, and I don't see why it should be any different in other jurisdictions, we should be super cautious about the importance of witness demeanor, and we should be, uh, in general terms, pushing for remote hearings if the other side are kicking up a fuss about the importance of demeanor and credibility. Um, in the civil cases, we're looking usually where credibility is an issue at cases of fraud or dishonesty. Um, I, I speak from personal experience, the courts and the tribunals hate the notion of dealing with those sorts of issues remotely. There's a case that did the rounds on social media uh, right at the start of lockdown. It's the case of um, INRI One Blackfriars Limited. Um, it, it, it's an insolvency case. It makes quite dry reading. Um, but it was going to be a long trial, I think five weeks to deal with liability and damages. Uh, there were going to be four live witnesses of fact, 13 expert witnesses, and unsurprisingly, there was an application to adjourn. John Kimball QC refused that application, and he made the following comments. He said, virtually every step in issue was recorded or appeared to be recorded in a contemporaneous document. There were some 25 Lever Arch files of documents, and, he noted, no allegations of dishonesty or fraud. Uh, I pause at that point to say, well, why should issues of dishonesty or fraud not be apt for dealing with by where we've got to be, at least in part, to do with witness demeanor? Because the remote hearing doesn't let you assess witness demeanor. And for the reasons that Ali has outlined in some detail, Courts don't like dealing with issues of credibility when they can't see the witness in person. Um, I, I think that's a mistake. I think it's appropriate to ask where the risk of unfairness is. Uh, there might be reasons for not dealing with these sorts of cases in a remote hearing. It might be that you need the uh, individuals in court so that you can deal effectively with taking instructions, with holding conferences, with ensuring that the witness isn't being prompted. Uh, but for what it's worth, I think that a lot of those issues can be adequately controlled for outside of the court building. You can have, um, for instance, the witness attending at a solicitor's office and giving evidence in a sort of a supervised capacity. Uh, I, I pause to wonder whether that's a, um, a sort of potential lucrative side venture for people in our line of work. Um, but I think it's tolerably clear from the case law and from the available science that witness demeanour, at least where credibility is an issue, really shouldn't be any obstacle at all to proceeding remotely. Uh, so that's my sort of potted view of the science and the key case or two. Um, I've got more in the link to the blog post, which I'm sure that Sean will circulate after this together with the relevant cases. Um, I'm going to hand this over now to the uh, much more capable hands of Paul Mertens, who speaks from a uh, sort of family civil perspective. Um, over to you, Paul. Thanks very much, Ezra. Um, I have to say a really interesting scientific perspective on witness demeanour. Um, and it'll be interesting um, to see how those matters are approached in practice. From the family perspective, since lockdown, there have been at least five decisions from the higher courts in a family context concerning whether matters should proceed remotely. And what I intend to do in this part of today's webinar is to go through them and to look at the different matters that arise. In summary, what the cases appear to do is to try to navigate a middle ground between the civil and the criminal approaches that have been uh, set out to you. Uh, and, and what I think is most interesting about these cases is to see how they may come to inform the approaches that the other jurisdictions take um, in crime and, and in civil in the weeks and months to come. The first of the cases is a case um, re-P, a child remote hearing, um, which was decided back about a month or so ago now, uh, in which members of uh, our chambers, pump court chambers, appeared on behalf of the Guardian. It had been listed for a fact-finding hearing and the president intervened 
to uh, adjourn the case instead. The case involved very serious allegations of factitious injury. But the reason that we particularly alight upon it in this uh, context is that the judge made observations about the important role that it takes for a judge to be able to see all of the parties in the case when they're in the courtroom. And so it wasn't simply limited to um, cross-examination itself, but to be able to survey the whole of the um, case and all of the interested parties at the same time in the courtroom. One of the interesting points that's picked up in, in that case and, and um, reappears in some of the more recent cases concerns how effectively a party is able to engage with the proceedings. And of course, all of these cases give rise to concerns about the fairness of a trial um, and, and an individual's rights to receive a fair trial and their ability in particular to provide instructions to their, to their lawyers. The next case in a, in a family context, which is of importance, is the case of, of RIA children, uh, remote hearing, care and placement orders. And it's a decision of the Court of Appeal. Uh, and in that case, the, the first point that the Court of Appeal wanted to emphasise was that the decision about whether it's possible to proceed remotely is for each court to decide whether that be in the magistrate's court or all the way up into the high court. It was also pointed out that the decisions in previous cases could therefore only be of guidance and it was a fact sensitive issue. What that means of course is that one judge may take the view on a set of facts that another judge reaches a different view on and witness demeanour is one of those factors that has to be um, to be borne in mind. It was also recognised in that case that about two weeks into the lockdown process that it was a rapidly developing picture and that a decision that might be made on a particular day could be overtaken by events in the days that followed. Nevertheless the court felt it helpful to summarise some of the principles that the court might take into account in determining whether remote uh, hearings were a sensible uh, approach. In um, public law children cases, and of course that's the, case, the situation that we had with re-P and factitious injuries, it was said that those sorts of cases would not be deemed as suitable, albeit that certain cases could be. That there would need during the current lockdown period um, there to be exceptional circumstances to justify an in-person hearing. Uh, and it gave a number of uh, possible factors that may determine exceptionality. What were the issues to be decided? Was there any particular um, urgency, particularly bearing in mind the welfare of the children involved? And whether the parties were represented and whether the parties were likely to be able to participate fully whether the evidence would be oral or simply submissions, whether there would be lay or expert evidence, how long any hearings would last and any alternatives. And so the Court of Appeal in that case really tried to set out a number of factors for the courts to take and have regard to. We then come to the third of the cases that I summarise, which is a local authority uh, against M and F. And this was a decision of Mrs Justice uh, Leaven in the family division. And it's interesting because it really picks up on some of the points that Ezra made during his talk about um, demeanour in the civil courts. The way that the judge approached it in that case was from the other angle. And it was to ask this question, whether the court will be in a less good position to judge whether or not the witnesses are telling the truth. And so rather, than worrying about the risk that you wouldn't be able to judge demeanour, asking whether demeanour was really going to put you in a less advantageous position when considering the truthfulness or otherwise of their testimony. And that case specifically referred to the decision in SS Sri Lanka and the Secretary of State for the Home Department, uh, the, the, the case that was raised um, by Ezra during his talk. Despite that, a number of other observations were made in the case. 
it was pointed out, just like in the criminal context, that many witnesses do already give evidence by live link, particularly if they were vulnerable. And one point that I thought certainly bared further thought was the fact that in some instances, making adjustments such as allowing people to give their evidence by live link actually improves the quality of the evidence that they can give. And so particularly nervous or vulnerable witnesses give evidence by video because they give yeah. their best evidence to the court. That I think has an important thing to say about witness demeanor and to the question that the courts have to decide about what is the best way forward to determine the case. A judge should, in my view, be considering whether they're going to get better evidence in certain cases by conducting the hearing remotely and seeing people in the comfortable or more comfortable environment uh, during the current crisis. The fourth case that I will just touch upon very briefly is the case of, of re-Q a child. Uh, and in that case, the president, I think, concerned about his, uh, the application of his earlier decision in re-P, came back to clarify the scope of his decision. And he specifically set out that it was limited to those cases of factitious or induced illness, and pointed out that the remainder of his comments were obiter. In that case, he recognised the guidance of the Court of Appeal in RE-A, but also looked forward to guidance which is going to be produced by the Family Justice Observatory about remote hearings. All of that, of course, still comes back to the issue of demeanour and the judge's task of being able to consider the evidence properly. We then come to last Friday and the final of the cases that I'm planning to outline, which is a case of a local authority versus the mother and others, which has a neutral citation of 2020, England and Wales High Court 1233 family. Uh, and again, copies of all of these can, can be provided. In that case, what happened was that all of the expert evidence was heard remotely. There was then a pause in the proceedings to consider whether it would be possible to hear the remainder of the live evidence from the parties themselves by, by, by video. It was acknowledged that there were significant difficulties in doing so and concerns were raised about the fairness of the trial for the parties who would be affected by the decision. There were also issues in that case about the availability of the parties and indeed their legal representatives to attend an in-person hearing. Now, interestingly, that decision also postdates the Prime Minister's 50 page roadmap that was uh, published just about a week ago now. And it recognised that for vulnerable people, this issue is not short lived. It's likely to continue for many months uh, to come. And what that case does, and I think importantly for our consideration of the issues, is it points out some of the advantages that come from an in-person hearing and says that while it's not only demeanour which is important, you also have to bear in mind the ability of a party to give running instructions to their representatives about the oral evidence that's being given by others. And as an advocate, I can certainly say from a number of um, uh, cases that I've been involved in, that those prompts from a client can be very important. They can change the angle that one's taking to cross-examination. And of course, if, they're, if you're not in the same room, if you're not able to take those instructions and have to wait until an appropriate pause in the proceedings to catch up with the party, well, the opportunity may be missed. The force that can come from good cross-examination can be diminished if you're only going to ask about the issue 30 minutes or an hour later. And so again, it comes back to the question of how we achieve fairness and the best possible evidence in the circumstances. For my own part, I share the reservations that there are about assessing witnesses based on their demeanor. But it's also recognized that these are challenging times 
and to simply delay matters for many months won't do justice either. And so it's about finding an appropriate solution in each case. And, and that's what I think these family cases do show us. And so, as I said at the start of my talk, I think the interesting thing here will be to see how the principles that are being developed very quickly, almost week by week in the family division, will come to be applied in, in the other context of civil and in criminal cases. That brings me to the end of what I intended to talk to you about this morning. There is an opportunity now for um, anybody who wishes to, to ask questions. And if you want to ask one of us in particular, please say so. Otherwise, we'll pick up um, any questions from the chat function um, that you have available to you, uh, and we'll try and answer it as best we can. Um, following the webinar this morning, we'll also be sending out some information about the cases that we've referred to and various other resources and those will include our contact details so if you want to get in contact um, and, and seek our assistance with something please do so we, we certainly welcome the opportunity to, to go through things um, so at that stage i'll ask ezra and, and ali to, to join me again and um, if you have any questions please type them into the uh, chat function and, and we'll have a look and, and see what we can help with um, Paul, just just while people are um, considering questions, can I? Um, I've had a query about who to contact to get the materials that we'll be distributing. Um, I, I, I hope and trust that our extremely hardworking and long-suffering Sean Collum um, is the person to be getting in touch with, and you should already have his email. Um, I will circulate it in the chat box. Yes, that's right. Right, well, I can see that there's one question that's, that's shown up in my um, uh, chat box here. Um, uh, I'll read it out in case anybody can't access it and is on the telephone. It says, interested in the panellists' views on neurodiverse conditions such as autism, which can affect the behaviour or demeanour of a witness. Um, I wonder if that's something that best aligns itself with the scientific approach that Ezra talked about. So. Um this is something I've encountered in the employment tribunals. My, um, I, I don't, I'm not in a position to assist on the scientific evidence. Uh, in terms of the approach that the tribunals take, um, my view is actually the tribunals are pretty good at taking into account um, people who are not neurotypical or, uh, in fact, casting out a bit more widely, people who've got communication issues due to um, deafness, or I suppose in other instances, language difficulties. My sense is the tribunals are quite good at filtering out bias for that. My sense is, conversely, that tribunals are quite bad at filtering out bias for the sorts of demeanor cues that I've canvassed in my talk. Um, I, I suppose the, the one scientific factoid that I can put out there is that when it comes to detecting deception, people perform worse when they're confronted with people from different ethnic backgrounds. So I think there's, there's a background racial bias there to watch out for. Um, it, but in terms of conditions like autism, um, I, I think that's probably about as far as I can assist. Um, just picking up from where Ezra has left off, I have encountered um, individuals with neurodiverse conditions in the criminal courts and I'm of the view that the criminal courts are extremely accommodating to individuals with neurodiverse conditions in particular with autism and the way that the courts accommodate for these conditions are through things like special measures making sure that they can have breaks often if and where there are medical reports uh, Personally, from my experience, it's something that I would deal with in closing and I would ensure that a, that a jury or the tribunal of fact is fully aware of the impact of their condition on the way in which they have given evidence. I will address that in my closing submissions, but if it's not done by myself, then often you do get judges that address those issues. So I, I'm of the view that the, the criminal courts are very good at accommodating for individuals with autism and other conditions such as that. Um, 
we have another question that's been asked and, it, and it's this, is there any scientific evidence regarding picking up untruth by tone of voice? And it's actually one that I find quite interesting. I'll say something about it and then the others may want to come back as, as well. And um, why I think it's interesting is that the logical outcome of a lot of these considerations is should we be hooking up witnesses to a lie detector to ascertain whether there are changes in body temperature, heart rate, and so on. Of course, that's never been the, um, the task or certainly the approach of, of the courts. One of the interesting things that does arise, however, with remote hearings, and it comes back to what I was saying about how we obtain the best evidence, is that you will occasionally hear of people saying that when somebody is making something up, that they'll look up to the top left, or it may be the bottom right, I can't quite remember. And in a large courtroom, there's very little chance that a judge would be able to spot those small details, those small ticks that people have, a bit like a show in a game of um, poker. And so slight variations in tone of voice may not carry across the room in any event. But on a recorded um, video uh, system like this, voices come through relatively clearly, and you often have a close-up image of just the person's face. You might ask, whether a judge would be better able to pick up on those little visual clues. But I think it still comes back to the, the, the real issue that Ezra raised, which is you might spot somebody looking up to the left or right, but could you reliably say that that is a reason to disbelieve them? Um, and, uh, sorry. Just picking up from um, what Paul was saying, uh, I do you have a, a, a small amount of information on this? Um, the short answer is when it comes to tone, no, not really. Um, there aren't good tone indicators of lying. What there is, is a pitch indicator of lying. And it is this. It's that liars tend to speak in a higher pitch relative to baseline performance. So in order to see whether someone's fibbing, you need to know them. And that's one of the reasons that family members are better at picking up on the lies told by family members than our jurors in a courtroom setting because they're familiar with the witness. Um, there's a question here about the criminal courts and I wonder whether it's one that Ali might be able to um, pick up. It says, interested in your views, could the need for video link evidence in criminal law be a possible efficiency saving for overcrowded magistrates courts? Could this be an opportunity for the criminal law to embrace the technology and innovate? In future it could make the court process faster, saving time and costs. I appreciate the disadvantages listing, but this could be necessary to move things forward. Um, Alejandra. I agree that it could make the court process faster, save time and money. However, from personal experience, there have been quite a few issues with the Skype hearings that the courts has been listing. For example, this morning I had a hearing that had to be adjourned because nobody could hear the interpreter. Whilst we could hear the judge and the other side and the defendant, we couldn't hear the interpreter, so the hearing couldn't go ahead. And this is one of my concerns about having video trials, is that not only do we have the technological issues that everybody seems to be encountering at the moment, there will also be external factors that we will not be able to control. Unless an individual were to go to a solicitor's office or to a police station in order to give their evidence, we risk there being external factors that influence one, the quality of their evidence and to their actual evidence. And therefore, in my view, it would be extremely risky to to the interest of justice and to the rights of defendants for trials to go ahead via video links. Great, if we could um, pick up on another of the questions. One of the things I think that I've been asked is um, whether we're still expected to file orders seeking a remote hearing in family matters at the outset, as per the template issued a few weeks ago, or are the courts now dealing with this of their own initiative. 
Well, in my experience, at least, I know a number of courts on the Western Circuit are proactively sending out orders to parties to ask for their views about the suitability for remote hearing. Many of you may well have heard about the slow implementation of the CVP cloud video platform in the courts, um, the county court and the family court in, in particular. And um, I know it's being considered whether some of those cases that were initially adjourned off might be recalled so that they could be dealt with remotely if, um, uh, if the parties considered that it would be suitable. And certainly last week I was involved in a case where it has now been listed for a final hearing um, to be dealt with entirely remotely over a platform such as Zoom or, or the CVP if it's then available. So um, I think the answer to the question is, if you consider that a matter is suitable for remote hearing, it certainly won't harm your chances of getting the case heard by saying so, but you may also start seeing orders coming out proactively from the court to seek the party's views about uh, the appropriateness of, of remote hearings. Um, moving uh, on, there's a couple of um, other things about the practical arrangements. Um, one on here is uh, what are people's views about the inability to completely control who's in the room regardless of a judge's uh, warnings. And I think that means in the room where the video is being recorded but off screen so that you can't see that they're, they're there. Is that something that one of you might pick up on? So I've, I've got a, a sort of a view from the, the civil side of things, which is, um, it, it, it's and this is a bit of a cop out answer, but it's I think it's the right answer. It's it's case specific. So there are some cases for which it would be appropriate simply to ask the witness to turn the camera around so that we can see that there's nobody in the room prompting them. Um, ultimately, that's not going to control entirely the possibility that they've got a prompt in the background over the phone or that someone's listening in. So I think that's something that militates against a remote hearing if you think there's a real prospect that the witness is going to be interfered with. Um, I have some personal experience of a witness giving evidence from his home. Uh, and this was in a Crown Court trial in Southampton. And the, the witness before he gave his evidence was warned about making sure there was nobody else in the room, that he didn't read from his statements, but that, if he, that he had it handy so that in case that he needed to refer to it, he could refer to it. Unfortunately, he read his statement throughout the entirety of the evidence. And it was only in cross-examination when I heard the shuffle of the papers that we all noticed that he had been reading his statement and that's a great risk that we run by having witnesses given their evidence completely remotely and I, I made the relevant submissions in my closing speech in relation to that but unfortunately we, we cannot control completely what a witness does from the comfort of their home who's in the room even if they turn the camera around it's a great risk and, and, and I in my view, it's a great bar to justice, and I would be completely against it. Thanks, Ali. I'm going to pick up on another of um, the questions that's been asked. Uh, the question is, it is presupposed that remote hearings would automatically assist vulnerable witnesses, for example, children and subjects of domestic violence not needing to give evidence in person. Um, do I or any of the other panel um, members have a view around any negatives that are evident from vulnerable witnesses not giving evidence in, in person. Um, well, I think the one that immediately springs to mind is how compelling evidence is when you see it live. And if I could give you an analogy, it's a bit like going to the theatre and seeing actors on the stage and comparing that to watching a theatre play on the television it doesn't necessarily have the same impact um, when, when we watch it uh, by remote means or, or over the television in, in the example given. And that may be a factor that affects some of those um, parties who might be pushed towards a remote hearing actually saying, no, I want to attend in person. I'm sure many of us have come across people like that in our practices where they've um, been very brave and, and, and got ready for the hearing and given 
completely compelling evidence in, in difficult circumstances. And so I, I think that is certainly a factor that could weigh in favour of seeking an in-person hearing. You may say the best evidence will be the evidence that's given in, in person. It, it allows for that human connection. It's, it's a bit like going back to what Ali said in the criminal context of people judging men's rare because they have a, a mental element. Seeing someone live may enable you to better um, form a view about that. Um, you've got to be careful, but that may still be the best way to, to, to conduct it. So that's what I would say in answer to, to that question. And can I, without wanting to stray outside my area of expertise too much, um, I, I, I did come across a bit of research uh, on the impact that's made by live evidence in um, specifically in rape cases. There's a 2003 study which found that the perceived credibility of complainants in rape cases is largely based on the expressed emotion of the complainant. So that's the first point. And also people who are doing these mock exercises for the research are, are simply not aware that they have that bias. So I, I agree with Paul that it's more compelling in person. Whether or not that means you're more likely to get a hearing or not, I think there's a question mark over that. Sorry, um, I, I think we do have time for perhaps um, one or two more questions. Um, I'm going to pick up on, on this one, which is what are the panel's views on the risk of any uncontrolled remote recording of the proceedings? Uh, and in fact, it's something that arose in the case I mentioned uh, I dealt with last week. In fact, in that case, the court asked one of the two advocates to make a recording of the proceedings and then send it to the court because they didn't have the facility to record it themselves. And I think both counsel, myself and, and the other counsel, had some concerns about that because of the um, GDPR implications of, of storage retention and, and having access to that recall, re recorded uh, set of proceedings. Um, and, I, and I do think that it's a valid issue to raise. The other issue that arises is that um, a bit like parties who attend a mediation but secretly record it on their mobile phone, is, is the risk that without prejudice hearings, for example, could later be referred to or um, a, a copy of the video relied upon uh, when it really shouldn't have been available to the party in the first place. So I think those are valid concerns, but, but the way to deal with it, in my view at least, is that the judge should make it plain at the outset that any recording is not acceptable and that if a party were to record the proceedings that it would be treated as a potential contempt of court. A bit like the situation that you have at the moment and in fact the criminal sanction as I believe it to be of recording or taking photographs in, in the county court or in the high court. Um, and so there are ways to mitigate that risk. Of course, it's not impossible that somebody will go on and make a recording, but they would be perhaps um, too brave, uh, not brave enough to uh, admit to that in the future and seek to rely upon it for the potential consequences that would flow from it. So um, that, that's my view about, about that one. I think we have time for, for one more if there is one. Um, Let's just have a look. Yes, there's one more question. It's um, similar to one that was asked earlier. Have the courts in recent cases cited the benefits of virtual hearings with regards to fairness and efficiency? Do we expect any guidance in relation to virtual hearings? And then it talked about the Family Justice Observatory guidance uh, and whether there are any other pieces of guidance that are being issued. Well, I think what the current lockdown um, period has certainly told me is that the sources of guidance are, are um, manifold. We've had guidance from the bar, uh, the inns of court, from um, the, the um, solicitor's profession, from various interested social bodies. And so I would expect that we will continue to receive uh, guidance, um, some measure of scientific review, about the appropriateness of remote hearings. And it might be said that this period of enforced 
remote hearings will come to inform the way that the courts develop in the future. I know that there are those who say that that is the way that we should be moving in the future anyway, particularly for, for example, lower value claims as a speedier, more efficient and more user friendly mechanism for resolving lower value um, disputes. Of course, that only works in, in certain contexts and, and it wouldn't for others. Um, at this stage, I haven't heard anybody say, well, we don't need to go back to regular in-person hearings once we safely can. There may be efficiencies to be had, but I think at this stage, those are still to be um, identified and, um, and that's something for the future. And um, just, just further to that, Paul, um, Certainly the view from the employment tribunals is an intention to proceed with uh, what they call blended hearings. So hearings where at least some component of it will still be remote, whether that's the witnesses or one or both of the parties. And the, the guidance that's come out from the tribunals is, I have to say it's fairly broad, um, the, the touchstone test for determining the method of hearing is the interests of justice, the overriding objective, and ultimately whether or not it will provide a fair hearing. So plenty of scope for argument. Um, from a criminal perspective, and I've seen a statement from the Recorder of London making the rounds on Twitter, there is the consensus that remote hearings will carry on post COVID-19 for things like mentions, pre-trial reviews and the shorter um, pre-trial hearings. Uh, I, I think that this would be a great step forward for the criminal justice system and it would promote better case ownership for counsel and for the defendants and well for the defendants and prosecution witnesses as well to have one individual throughout. It just promotes better continuity. It also means that as counsel we're not having to travel across the country for a two minute hearing where we don't say anything. Uh, so I think actually, whilst COVID-19 has been a disaster for the justice system and for society as a whole with lockdown and, and people very sadly passing away, I think that it will bring some positive and refreshing new ideas to the, to the justice system as a whole. And hopefully it will mean that we will step into the 21st century. And of course there's a strong advantage in getting your case heard sooner rather than later. It's almost inevitably in the interests of the parties, the court likes it, so if it can be done remotely it's possible to get it listed far sooner than it otherwise would. Well thank you very much everyone for attending um, this morning or this afternoon I should say's webinar. Um, we really enjoyed talking around the issues with you. If you do have any follow-up uh, questions, you'll be being sent a document with our contact details on there. We'd be delighted to try and help. And, and in the meantime, uh, do try to keep well and find ways of working um, that suit your particular circumstances and those of your, your clients. Um, and thank you very much. Can I can we just also thank uh, Simon Gore for hosting and Sean Collin for organising? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you.